This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fan Reporter Show made by fans for fans, part by the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I'm Nick, and with me is Anderson going to give us this week's topics. Well, we're the dog days of the offseason for the Pistons, so it's going to be all Lions, all show. It's the Fan Report. This is like... Don't get me wrong, like, I love football season, and I'm very happy it is back. But at the same time, when you're a fan and a someone who covers the Lions in, in terms of a mm-hmm. podcast, like what we do, mm-hmm. and they are not very good or yeah. very bad, it is, you know, it's not easy to figure out what there is. Because, I mean, it's not like we had expectations. So, you, you know, mm-hmm. normally when a team is bad, but you thought they'd at least be okay... There's stuff to talk about there, mm-hmm. but there's not because this is who we like. Yeah. They are who we thought they were. Yeah, like uh, I got the I got the chance to watch the game with my with my dad yesterday, and that first drive, you know, they looked nice. They drove right down the field. They scored. They sure and, looked okay for a half. Yeah. Like they didn't look and, terrible. Yeah, and my dad starts like jumping and cheering when they score that first touchdown, and I'm just like sitting there at the TV, and he goes, "What? You're not happy? Minutes. You're not excited?" <laughs> And I'm like, I've seen this movie before. I, mm-hmm. I know how it ends. We've <laughs> like, seen this movie for like Matthew Stafford's entire football career in yeah. Detroit. Like it was at no point throughout any of that football game was I like excited. No, I just I was like, oh, that was a good play. Yeah. Oh, they, I like the I like how the offensive line uh, protected uh, golf. You know, I, I'll be honest and with you. I thought the only it. bright spot in that game was the offensive line. Then I, I liked what I saw from Cephas. I really did like what I saw from Cephas that game. Cephas does seem to be yeah. coming into his own a little bit. Yes, mm-hmm. I'll agree with you there. But yeah, the, the, the big bright spot was definitely the offensive line. I, I believe Jared Goff had like almost three and a half seconds on average to throw the football. Right, which is great. Which is, yeah. That's fantastic. So, I mean, with that being said, I know we talked about it last week, and I know we gave our thoughts on what we should do when Taylor Decker does come back. But now I'm, I'm starting to kind of change my tune. By the way, by looking at how Panay Sewell has played in the two games against very good pass rushers, if not great pass rushers in terms of Nick Bosa, and then you had, I know Zadari Smith was out for the Packers, but they still had Preston Smith there. Like, he went up against very good pass rushing, and mm-hmm. he not only held his own, but was effective going up against these guys. So he, he clearly is able to play, like, a man in this league and play like a stud left tackle. So do you keep him at left tackle? Do you sit, tell do you sit Taylor Decker down and tell him, Hey, you know, Panay Sewell is the way we're going. And but is, is, is Taylor Decker at that point where like, he can't teach an old dog new tricks or do you think he can learn to play right tackle? I think he can learn to play right tackle. I think it's a situation where there's, there's, there's a pride factor involved in that. And he may not be willing mm-hmm. to the left tackle is considered the anchor of the line. It's, it's, quote unquote, the most important position on the line. It's the quarterback's blind side. They made a whole movie about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, so for a guy to have a rookie come in and just take his spot because he gets hurt, <laughs> there's a level of pride there that he may not be willing to give up on. Like he, he, mm-hmm. he may not be willing to move to the right side. And, yeah. you know, that's fair enough. He's earned his spot in the, in that, at left tackle in this league. And and frankly, he's a good left tackle. He's probably one of the yeah. top 10, 12 best left tackles in the game right now. Mm-hmm. Panay Sewell, however, could be one of the five best left tackles in the game. If, you know, trends continue the way they've started. Mm-hmm. It's a good problem to have. I mean, it's a great problem to have. No question. Mm-hmm. But that begs that, you know, gives you question of what do you do and what happens if Taylor Decker says no. I wish there was a team that had a similar problem, but at right tackle, and we could too. swap tackles. <laughs> you know, there is one team that kind of comes to mind as a team that really could be a potential trade trade match here, and it's the Indianapolis mm-hmm. Colts. They just hmm. lost their left tackle, I believe, for a long time, if not the season. I, and I'm pretty sure it's Eric Fisher. They need a left tackle because they clearly want to go for it this year after bringing in Carson Wentz. Maybe that's a guy if Taylor Decker refuses to move to the right side or move inside to left guard and move Jonah Jackson over to the right side. Like that's a that's a potential candidate that for a trade right there. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I we're talking way ahead of ourselves. They haven't even answered asked the question to Taylor Decker. But if that were to happen, who knows? 
I'm not real sure. Like I, I, I would like to see Taylor Decker. If, if the lions are going to stand pat and say, Panay Sewell is our left tackle, then I would like to see Taylor Decker be willing to move to the right side, but that in all likelihood that may not happen. So, uh, but as of right now with what I've seen from Panay Sewell at left tackle and then comparing it to how he was at right tackle and compared to Taylor Decker at left tackle, mm-hmm. like I, I have no reason to say, mm-hmm. sit here and tell you, I, I have no reason to even say what I said last week. That moving forward, Panay Sewell needs to be our right tackle. Like, I know mm-hmm. that's what I said last week because we do have time. And, and part of me still does believe that. But if you have a guy at left tackle that can be a star, mm-hmm. like I'm talking a superstar, like one of the top five in the league, that's an extreme strength that yeah. to have is big and could be a, a, you know, a big step in the right direction for this organization. So I am going to kind of backtrack. And I'm allowed to change my opinion on this because I saw another game of work. It's kind of like science, you know, you, you learn more things, you change your hypothesis. Exactly. Like, <laughs> change so, your theories. As of right now, I lean towards keeping Paniso at left tackle and figuring out what to do with Taylor Decker after that. I mean, I, I don't disagree at all. It's It goes back to the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And um, it was broke before, and now it ain't broke. So well, I, I mean, don't I, fix I can't, it. <laughs> you can't really argue that the left tackle position was broke because no, Taylor Decker I'm was saying, a good left tackle. Um, I'm talking about uh, Panay Sewell. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we, I mean, you don't really know if he was yeah, going to be know. a bad right tackle, but I, if yeah. preseason was any indicator, it wasn't going to be great. Yeah. So I did want to kind of ask you a question about this Monday night game. Do you remember, I can't even tell you how long ago it was, but the Monday night game up against the Chicago Bears. Where how did the, I know that was the one you were going for? Well, they, like if you if, yeah. if you go to a Lions fan that's over the age of like twenty or eighteen, mm-hmm. whatever, and you say Monday night game, what's yep. the game they're going to think of? The game against the it's, Chicago Bears yeah. on Monday night. And I want to say that was what twenty thirteen, maybe something like that. I don't know. But thinking about that game and the excitement that was leading up into it, the twenty eleven. Okay, so it was really the first year the Lions were any good in at least recent our. In the last mm-hmm. couple decades, basically, since Barry yeah. left. Do you remember the hype and excitement surrounding that game? Oh, and yeah. How I ordered a pizza just, for that game. Just <laughs> how excited everybody was. You make it sound like that's not an ordinary thing you do for a football game. <laughs> uh, when you're just by yourself. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Fair enough. I, but, I, it, was the, it was the one time I didn't have plans for a nationally televised Alliance game. And I'm like, well, I'm ordering a pizza. <laughs> But the excitement levels surrounding that game compared mm. to the level oh. of or lack thereof, the Ford of Field was so loud. I know, in that like game. you could oh. tell it on, you could tell on TV, you could hardly hear the the commentators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how loud it was. They forced false starts, like they they forced mm-hmm. penalties, like it was great, it was awesome. Now let's fast forward to this past Monday night, or past Sunday, right. or this past weekend. But you also gotta you also gotta think about. It. I believe the Lions were undefeated still going into that game. I don't even. But I like that's irrelevant. Yeah. I mean, it makes it's relevant, but like yeah, it's at the relevant. Same time, it's still like we're two games into the season, or we were only yeah. one game into the season. No, th- th- that was to go like five I, no, and I'm or talking, six and oh. I, I'm talking like this. this oh, week, you're talking about this one. Like gotcha, this gotcha, past gotcha. week. Yep. So like you could still have some excitement for this team. You know, we're not zero mm-hmm. five sitting there dead ducks. Yep. This team could still have some excitement, but you honest to God, if you were walking around the city of Detroit or talking to fans in the city of Detroit, it could have been a 10 o'clock game over in London for all I knew yeah. like, or, or a one o'clock game on a Sunday. Like nobody cared that they were playing mm-hmm. on Monday night. The excitement level was at just an extreme low. Mm-hmm. The energy was just not there. And if that's <laughs> not just like the personification of there is nothing to be excited about with this team mm-hmm. this year. I don't know what else is. Like, and we it's had a nothing. Nationally televised game and nobody cared. It's nothing against this this regime, this co- uh, this coaching staff or anything like that. It's just we know that we're nowhere near the level of competing yet. We're in year one of a rebuild, so we we know that every game we walked in, we walk into, it's gonna be ugly. And it was it actually looked better than I thought it was going to look on Monday night, but there were times where it looked very very ugly. Half of that game. Looked pretty good. The other half was very ugly. Yeah. And and I'm sorry to all the fans out there. I, I'm sorry I was five points off on my prediction of a 40 burger by uh, or a 40 <laughs> bomb by Aaron Rodgers. I was five mm-hmm. points off. I know. But first off, who would have predicted Aaron Jones four touchdowns? That's kind of wild. 
three receiving, which is what threw me through a loop. That was kind of really yep. weird. But if that doesn't tell you right there how much further ahead like that regime and that system is than what we're, we have built here in the lines or lack thereof in terms of what's being built or has been built, the fact that they can draw up plays that spring a running back wide open in the end zone, not once, not twice, but three times. Multiple times. Like that right there tells you they are so head and shoulders above. Like they, they, they're in the year 3000 lines are still in 1995. There is so much catching up to do with this coaching staff, with this player personnel, with this team, the playbooks, everything to get them into a situation to where they are competing with some of the better teams in the league. And I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Packers are the best team in the league. I'm not going to sit here and tell you the best team in the NFC. I don't think they're that close. I think they're a good team. I think if the they Lions would be had won this game, people would be arguing they're probably one of the worst teams in the league. <laughs> right. Because of how they looked last week against the Saints, who this week looked god awful. So the Lions sitting here, right here, right now, the Lions could be the worst team in the NFL. The Dolphins are really the only other team I can think of that look as bad. Maybe the Jets. But I mean, Zach Wilson looked solid in his first game. Mm-hmm. Week two, he looked terrible. I'm just surprised that. That Green Bay didn't attack us more through the air. You know, uh, Devontae Adams was mostly quiet until that uh, 50 yard catch, right. that I believe, to be in the third quarter it was. So I'll tell you why the Packers didn't attack us through the they air. They didn't need to. <laughs> There's that. Well, no, it, I don't even, I, I don't think it's that. It's the route to success. The route to, su- to success for the Green Bay Packers has changed in the last three years. The route is no longer on Aaron Rodgers' arm. The route to success has now turned into running the football for the Green Bay Packers in the last three years. And and the facts, the stats prove that mm-hmm. games where Aaron, where they've lost. Like, I think I, I saw a stat where the last seven games the Packers have lost. Aaron Jones touched the ball no more than eight times in any of those games. The games that they had won since like the middle of last year. Aaron Jones touched the ball at least 15 times in all those games. The route to success for the Packers has been through Aaron Jones and through their running game. Oh, I don't disagree. Uh, all I'm saying is that, especially after if you got to Melifonu is out, we, we're big, we barely have an NFL caliber secondary. Like that's like, why, that's why I was surprised. Healthy, it. Barely an NFL caliber <laughs> secondary. Yeah. And now we're down like third stringers. So like I, really I straight up don't NFL think we have secondary. a first, like a, a, a starting defensive back on our roster on any other team. Like I, I, our is probably a third, like a second string corner, a third or fourth mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. AJ Parker, probably a second string or third string corner. He's a nickelback. Like he, mm-hmm. he's probably a second string nickel or a fourth yeah. corner. Uh, Jeff Okuda. He probably ain't even seen the field for a lot of teams right now. Melifon Wu, second string, third string. These guys are starting for our team. That's what I'm saying. Like when they when they went to the, when they went to the pass, for the most part, they had no issues. They just didn't. It just felt like they didn't need to push the issue. They just they were they were comfortable to sit back, running the ball or or checking down Aaron Jones. And it, what it what I for felt the like part. the Packers had in mind in that game was we are going to run our game script the way that we want to. And the mm-hmm. way that we envision us running the rest of the year. This is how we mm-hmm. want to play football. And you know what? This is basically a practice for us because they can't stop our game script. It felt like a practice. It felt like the Packers were barely trying out there. It and, really and did. That's, and that's my point. Like it, it literally was their offensive coordinator saying, just run things how we run them in practice. Mm-hmm. Run through the game script. Run through the playbook. Let's you know get into a rhythm and just get comfortable so that we can build on this for next week. Because the Lions were not going to threaten them on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. Like they, they, I mean, I, they got to Aaron Rodgers three times. So kudos to the offensive line or defensive line there. But other than that, they did not threaten at all. Yeah. Defensively speaking, Aaron Rodgers was comfortable in the pocket. He was able to make the, the read he wanted. Aaron Jones was able to make plays through the air and on the ground. Like there was no stopping anyone. So the Packers didn't really need to, to lean on anybody as a hero in that game. They could just, run the plays they wanted yeah. run the script that they envisioned to be their path to success this year. And the lions weren't going to stop them. 
The Lions weren't stopping anybody. No, it, I mean <laughs> the the Forty ers proved that. I, I would argue the the <laughs> Packers offense is far better than the Niners offense. I will be honest though. I, I did I did like the all whites, but I, I don't. I think this is not the season to get cute with it. Like. <laughs> It's, it's it's kind of embarrassing to to roll out in these alternate uniforms on a, on a national televised game and just get smacked. So like, the all whites were sweet. I'll, I like I'll give them. them that. That's what I'm saying. I like them. I I mean, I guess there has to be something to talk about this year. Yeah. <laughs> but well, I, like, I we know to, we know we're gonna lose. Let's make headlines for something. <laughs> I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on Jared Goff because I actually think he looked pretty solid in this game. Now again, it was a lot of checkdowns, a lot of short routes. But I do believe he brought his yards per attempt up this week by like a yard and a half, if I recall. I think he was up near six this week. Um, by, by just under a yard. He was 5.9 last week, 6.8 this week. Okay. So up near seven. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it seems like he's starting to develop a little bit of a, of a rapport or relationship with these pass catchers and TJ Hawkinson and Quintus Cephas mm-hmm. in particular. Mm-hmm. So does that kind of give you something to look at the rest of this year that maybe we'll start to see some improvement from the passing game in particular as guys like Cephas start to build upon their game. I I expect to. Now let's let's lay the groundwork here. When you when you have as much time as Goff had to throw the ball, my expectations already rise because you better be able to do something with that time. But Goff made some real money throws last night and I'm I'm seeing that connection right, with saving Quint- that as a drop. Because <laughs> we will never oh. hear that again. Oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am seeing that connection with Quintez grow, which I like to see. Obviously, everyone came in expecting Hawk to get hammered with the ball. So, and he, he had he had nine targets, eight catches on nine targets. Is it weird TD. to say that I actually don't think he got as many targets as I was expecting him to? I was literally expecting a 15 target game for DJ Hawkinson. <laughs> I mean, when. He he got open like quite a bit, and the dude, I don't know if you saw the the touchdown to uh, TJ in the corner of the end zone that over the shoulder fade. Oh, it was a oh, great my. play, great pass, great catch. Great, like, it was yeah, an absolute great pass dime. and great catch. It was right absolute on the money. And yeah, so like for the most, I did not see golf make many mistakes. So he did I'd, throw a pick. He threw a pick, but I'm just, I said on a whole, I didn't see him make many mistakes. And I fair. I like what I saw. Ground game needs to improve which in all reality is kind of the opposite of what we were thinking coming into the season. I, mm. I never would I have thought I'd be sitting here telling you the passing game looked better than the ground game right now. Like, yeah, the ground game so far this year has not looked great. Like I know Jamal Williams had a solid week last week, but a lot mm. of it was through the air. Swift really is yet to get going. I know he's still kind of hampered by that groin injury, but I'll be honest. So he looked nice at the times he got the ball. He just didn't get the ball a ton. Fair. I I just I need to see more out of these guys, especially yeah. DeAndre Swift, because he's a guy that we're really h- hinging our future on. So I, I need to see more out of him moving forward. No, I agree. It what what we saw was not good enough. It was not even close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just... Um, moving out of the other side of the ball, like oh no, <laughs> can can someone explain to me what the hell happened to Derek Barnes and why he didn't play a single defensive snap this week? Is he hurt and we just don't know it? He would played special teams. Oh, well, then he's not hurt. I, I don't know. Maybe he's in the doghouse. Maybe he did something in practice. <sighs> the guy looked like your best linebacker in, in the preseason. Why is he not getting opportunities to play on the defense side of the ball? In all reality, I think he may be the only linebacker the Lions have that can go out and run and, and play sideline to sideline as a linebacker. I think he's the only one. Mm-hmm. So he may not be wrong. Uh, why isn't he getting opportunities? It's not like we're in a situation where we can't afford to play a rookie because he may make a mistake Mm -hmm. because we can. And we are like, there's a lot of guys out there. Like if you have to Melifon move, for example, who actually I thought played pretty solidly in that game. Yes. He got beat on the play. He got hurt. I agree. Devante was quiet for much of the first half. And there's a, there's gotta be reason for that. Like, it's hard to it's hard to gauge when you're watching on the broadcast because you can't really see downfield unless the camera pans downfield. But I usually take a sign of a star receiver being quiet for a full two quarters as he was covered fairly well for two quarters. Aaron Rodgers is a quarterback who has made a living and a superstar Hall of Fame living off of attacking inexperienced corners. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, Melifanu's name really wasn't called a ton. 
Mm -hmm. until he got beat for a 50 yarder and then got hurt. Like, I I thought he played a solid game. Was it perfect? No. But was it solid? Yes. Like, he he was probably one of the better corners out there. Yeah. So let's let's hope it's not a long term injury. I wonder if we have any updates on that. From what I've heard, it doesn't sound great. Uh, Dan Campbell even said it's not great. I, I do have an update. It well, this is from CBS. It says it's quote unquote. Uh, Dan Wilkett said, "Yeah, it's a bad one." Yeah, uh, that was after looks the like game. Looks like he'll be out for a little bit. Okay, that was after the game. Yeah, I was asleep by then. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the injuries are no help. Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong; they, they obviously don't make that much of a factor in this team winning games because they weren't going mm-hmm. to win games with these guys regardless. But yeah. It's big in terms of development. Like Melifon was a guy I would have really liked to see continue to develop this year. Jeff Okuda, again, a guy I would argue had to develop this year, and he didn't because he got hurt. Mm-hmm. So to not have either of these guys playing for a long period of time, or in Okuda's case at all, like that's a detriment to the future of this franchise because there is a lot invested in a guy like Okuda. There's not as much invested in Melifon, but still... How do we lose two of our supposed top three corners in the first two weeks? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> well, stop getting beat. Then you wouldn't overextend yourself. Sure. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> hey, it helps us on our march for the number one pick. It does. Don't get you know, me. I'm like, not sure how worth of right the number now, one pick is going to be this year. But we'll as see. of right now, the Lions look like the front runners for the number one pick. They yeah. Do. Let's just keep wearing those white jerseys all the way to the to the finish line. Sure. Waving the white. You think flag. we're going to see them again, the white on whites? No. I, I think I they were a primetime football situation. I agree with you. So I, 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 I we may see them next year if we get a primetime game. I, who the hell decided to put the Lions in a primetime game? They're like a rivalry game. Oh, wait, we forgot. This isn't a rivalry if one team. It hasn't been is a rivalry barely... since like, <laughs> 1940. <laughs> or 1960. I'll be nice. <laughs> I mean, the Lions, even when they're bad, they always play the Packers well. But there, there comes to a point where you just don't have the personnel sure. to play against the NFL football team. No, like so. <laughs> the Lions seriously are so far behind. Like they this is a full rebuild from the ground up. If anybody thinks otherwise, just go just watch film from the first two weeks of the season. Sure. They have nothing, nothing that they're working with. Mm-hmm. Like they have a couple of guys like they TJ, have the offensive line. That's all we have in place. TJ the offensive line. looks pretty nice. The O line. Mm-hmm. All right. Pieces of it look pretty nice. The right side still, uh, you know, quite suspect, but the left side looks pretty nice. We're depending on who you got there. Mm-hmm. Like Swanson, Jackson, Decker or Sewell looks real good. Either one you put in, but the right side, not so much. You know, you got to keep mm-hmm. building there. Even like the backfield doesn't look as solid as it did. The receiving core literally is zero. You 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 were relying on Khalif Raymond to be a guy that was successful for you, or yep. Tyrell Williams to be your top receiver. Woof. <laughs> and even he's hurt too. <laughs> I know. Like the, the this team has nothing. Mm-hmm. And now looking forward, you know, if you want to look at next year's draft, the guys you thought were going to be really good top end quarterback prospects, some of them don't look so hot. Yeah. Rattler for OU does not look so good. I'm saying like, I'm Sam wondering Howell. if this is even a good year to have a number one pick. Right. Sam Howell. <laughs> he hasn't looked fantastic. Like th- there's doesn't look too hot. So maybe mm. you do take the pass rusher and you move on. Yeah. Grab your QB next year. It's, it's even if you do grab your QB, you're still not going to have anybody to throw to. Fair. Do you think Kenny Galladay wishes he was back in Detroit? I mean, he, he looks sure, like he hates it. On, on the he Giants. sure looks miserable in New York. Yeah. Like my God, who wouldn't be? Jesus. Based, but honestly, based on the sounds of it, you'd think it would have had to be a better situation than Detroit. Have you I've, not heard any of these pundits talk about how Matthew Stafford was essentially <laughs> held hostage and, and tied up and <laughs> thrown in the closet after every single game he played here? <laughs> Like, my God, I'm sorry, Matthew, that we as fans just oh, just beat you mercilessly. <laughs> that as a as an organization, you were just so uh, you poor thing. Mm-hmm. Well, what did what did Kelly Stafford say? Like, she hasn't seen him enjoy she hasn't football seen him in a had, long time. F- have fun playing football <laughs> and since she can remember. <laughs> and then the, the broadcast puts somebody who's <laughs> not Kelly Stafford on TV with Kelly Stafford underneath. <laughs> I thought I started dying. 
when I saw that. And the best part about it was she ended up finding out who that woman was and then went and took a picture with her. I'm dead. <laughs> the you amount know. of just slobbering all over Matthew Stafford by the media, like Chris Collins with, I had no idea he was as good as he is. <laughs> or oh. like the guys on, on, I think it was the CBS guys that I, I watched in in like before the I think it was before the four o'clock game started or during commercials for the four o'clock game like the guys mm-hmm. after it was right after the Rams game whatever it was yeah. the guys that you know the Terry Bradshaws and that group that were just it was the Fox team that's who it was mm-hmm. uh, just sitting around the desk and talking about how when's the last time Stafford's won back to back football games just, and it, fun fact it's 2017 <laughs> yikes <laughs> it's it, it, it tells you that but it does tell you that no like and like no nfl analyst or pundit ever actually watches a lions game they just box score watch like, that's but it but the absolute just, just <laughs> trashing of the or of the lions this year i feel like oh, it's yeah. turned into the new fun thing to do mm-hmm. like don't get it's me like, wrong i do like it like enough as just, a fan here <laughs> It's like what we discussed a few few episodes ago. It's it goes back to that Detroit versus everybody thing where I see. I don't even think like I don't want to use that as a. It's a cop. I know, man. It's I know. Me and you, me and you have very different interpretations of Detroit versus everybody, but like I just think it's the. That's what I think of when I I think of Detroit versus everybody. The whole argument of like this organization has been very bad they have not taken Mm -hmm. care of their stars look at the calvin johnson situation for that very true yeah but also matthew stafford has to take some of the blame for his situation here he was here for 10 years he signed three or four contracts here Mm -hmm. he didn't have to Mm -hmm. they didn't you know put a gun to his head and say sign the contract or you and your family are dead like that that that's not a scenario that ever happened here yeah he willingly came back for a boatload of money. So boo-hoo to him that he's made almost a half a billion dollars in his during his tenure here. He's got a real nice home to show for it, too, yeah. and a beautiful family. I just love at how, like, surprised people are at how good Stafford is with the Rams, and yet, like, every Detroit fan, like, fully expected. They're like, oh, yeah, he's going to tear shit up in L.A. He's got a good <laughs> team there. The Rams yeah. were a good team with Jared Goff there. I mean, yeah. uh, like, is any uh, how anyone is surprised is beyond me. But mm-hmm. like the the whole the fact that they are just made that turning him into a, just a total sacrificial lamb, like he never did anything wrong here. He never made a mistake. Never threw a pick. Never took a bad sack. Never made a bad throw. Never was the reason the Lions lost a football game. Fun fact: he was the reason several times. <laughs> he played a lot of bad games here. <laughs> He made a lot of bad throws, a lot of bad picks, especially in the recent years. To say that he, the Lions, never gave him a chance for success, like, do you? you people don't realize he he played with a Hall of Fame wide receiver. One, mm-hmm. two, he had a number two defense in probably what was the Lions' best opportunity to win when they lost to the Cowboys in in that playoff yeah. game. And and Lions fans love to blame it on the refs. Well. I kind of blame Stafford and the offense a little bit more. They scored nine points in three quarters of football. Yeah, and that that running back group with uh, Joyke and Reggie, that was you could argue was the best. They both had over a thousand yards on had. purpose. Yeah, you could argue it's the best run game he had. I think the only other argument you can make for that is Java best pre injury. Sure, pre pre tenth concussion. I was gonna say pre <laughs> how many concussions because he had like four in college, well documented <laughs> once. Stafford absolutely deserves some culpability in the Lions' lack of success. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of games he did not play well, and he also continued to sign here. Mm -hmm. If he wasn't having fun, why the hell would you sign? Because I promise you, he would have gotten the money somewhere else. And it's not like he went into the front office and made any kind of demands. You need to bring this guy in. You need to get that. You need to get me this. Or I'm out. I'm not re-signing. He didn't make anything like that. At some point, like how many times have we seen Aaron Rodgers throw a hissy fit and be a baby back bitch because he's unhappy with the front office? I swear to God, it happens every offseason. But you know what? The dude wins. I just don't understand how he's just this absolute sacrificial lamb and he did no wrong and he's just this poor Matthew. It's annoying. It's not so much like the Lions don't deserve to be shit on for being a bad organization because they do and they are. I do think we still have one of the worst ownership groups in the league. 
if not in sports. Oh, I was gonna say we have the worst ownership group in sports. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no question about that. <laughs> you can only be this bad for this long for one reason. What has to happen for the NFL to actually remove? It'll never ownership? happen. It'll <laughs> never happen because the Fords are like grand a legacy owner. Yes, they are considered <laughs> legacy. That's like trying to take the the Steelers away from the Rooney family. Like, that'll never happen. Yeah. It will only leave the family. You know the, the big Ford difference hands. in the, St- the Rooney family and the Fords? Success. There you go. <laughs> like, I, if the Steelers had very little success, though, like it would never happen at this point. But the only way that the Lions will ever leave the hands of the Ford ownership group mm-hmm. is by them selling. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like, that, that is it. And... The Lions do deserve a lot of blame for being a bad organization and do deserve to be shit on. But yeah. to make Stafford out to be this all saving grace that like this savior for whoever. Mm-hmm. Come on. That just shows you didn't watch football in this town because he wasn't all that great all the time. Like he's a good quarterback, even arguably sometimes almost put himself into that elite group. Yeah. Almost. But he had a Hall of Fame receiver to kind of help him get there. But also on your side of the coin, watch uh, watch when the entire watching all the NFL analysts freak out the first time they notice Matthew Stafford throwing no looker. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I, Chris Collinsworth may like have to go to the bathroom with some tissues after. Like it, the dude, come on! <laughs> the the minute Matthew Stafford pulls off a sweet play or the the sidearm pass that Stafford loves to do like underneath mm-hmm. the line the defensive line's oh, yeah. arms like that sidearm ball the minute he does that i think one of these guys on that fox desk are going to have a stroke <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that throw is possible <laughs> i have never seen that before in my life I, I mean it is the nature it is the luxury of playing in la it's like in all reality and this is across all sports. LA is an easy town to play in as an athlete. There's no media scrutiny there. Like yeah. it just doesn't exist. Like nobody blames LeBron for, you know, essentially taking the season off when they missed the playoffs in his first year mm-hmm. there. Nobody blames him for literally destroying that team. Yeah. Nobody blames him for last year when they didn't make it very far. Like, it's an easy town to play ball in to, to mm-hmm. football, basketball, baseball. Like you don't get the media scrutiny there. Put a, put yeah. him in New York, Boston. Because the LA market is never a market that you want to alienate. So you, right, they're like beyond reproach. Put him in New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit. Those are tough markets. Mm-hmm. We will get on you. Yeah. We will come at you, and the media definitely will. Just mm-hmm. ask uh, Jim Caldwell. What did he say? Yeah. It's Dungeon of Doom. Dungeon of Doom. Yeah. <laughs> but honest question. So, like, going back to the Lions, how they are currently, how much rope, like, oh, like how much rope are you giving this coaching staff? Like, for me personally, I this year's a wash, man. This team is. This so what I'm saying. Bad. <laughs> I can't hold anything that happens with this no with, in this season against the coaching staff because they're working with. I want I, all I want to see is progression from guys like Goff, guys like Swift, mm-hmm. guys like Cephas, Hawkinson, McNeil. I would have loved to see progression from Okuda and Melifonwu, but we're not going to get that. Nope. Derek Barnes. Like I, I want to see the very basic beginnings of a bit of a foundation showing here. Mm-hmm. And I don't th- and I'm not even going to sit here and tell you any of these guys are the foundational pieces moving forward but just a little bit of an identity, a little bit of something to make me go into next off season and say, all right, let's build. That's all I want. And that's not even yeah. asking a lot. Cause you can fake that. Like, let's Matt finish Patricia the Bob season with a respectable, <laughs> let's finish the season with a respectable run game. We had the pieces there for that. We do. So let's, we do. Let's try to see some improvement in the run game over the course of this season. I guess that's like the one thing I'll track. This coach step on is I, you know what? Has the Here, run game improved from game one to game seventeen? Here's something else that I want to see from the Lions this season. This is more of like an organizational standpoint. I want to see this regime in terms of this coaching staff in front office kick the Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia image out to where we no longer talk about it. I want to see no semblance of it. 
Nobody even gives it a thought because it is completely different now. I think it is already completely different. I don't I, I, I can't say that yet. Because we do still see a lot of pieces here from it. We do still see. Oh, well, there's that. The I'm lack talking about of success, the, like, the general culture and attitude around the locker room. I want to see it kicked entirely to where we don't give it another thought. So you don't and want any players from that era? No, on this team? I don't think that's the case. We can keep the solid players from there. I just don't want to see any of that image. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Like, mm. I want us to be so far removed from that culture that we don't even look at it anymore. Mm hmm. Right now, we still compare it every day. I hear it every single day. Bob Quinn, Matt Patricia, I hear their names hell more than I hear Brad Holmes' name. I mean, let's be honest. That Kelly, that Kelly Stafford comment was probably referring to the Matt Patricia, Bob Quinn. Or like. I would absolutely agree with you. Matt Stafford seemed to have a great time with Jim Caldwell here. Yeah. But I don't ever want, like, that's the one thing I want out have of the season. I want our identity to be changed in a way that we don't even talk about those guys anymore. Have you ever seen a coach and GM set a franchise back as far as those two did? You know, like they, they didn't have. just they didn't what, just set us know, back personnel wise. They they set back the image of the city. Like, I, I have <laughs> in my lifetime. In fact, I have in this city. So I'm Matt Millen, a gentleman by the name of Matt Millen, <laughs> <laughs> did it for a long time here, and we gave him an extension. <laughs> So uh, to answer your question, yes, we are no strangers to this. We well, didn't even Matt, get much time in between. Matt Millen didn't know how to draft. But at least he didn't like make the players miserable. <laughs> he didn't know how to draft. He didn't know how to sign. He didn't. Uh, Harry <laughs> Sanders was miserable with Millen here. Wasn't that pre-Millen? I thought Millen got here in the late nineties. I thought he was early thousands, but I could be wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll give I, it to you because I, I couldn't really here. say I was a Lions fan before like two thousand three. So. <laughs> okay, you're right. 2001 to 2008. Yeah. So, I mean, Joey Harrington was miserable here. That's just because he was terrible. You're not wrong. <laughs> However, is that, is that the worst draft pick in Lions history? Is, no, it, is it Joey God Harrington? No. God, no. No. Third overall? No. Quarterback of the future? I'll tell you right now, Joey <laughs> Harrington was not utilized in the proper way here in Detroit. I, if you, uh, so I actually went back and read an expose about Joey Harrington's career. Call me weird. I don't care. Uh, I, it was actually fairly recent. The Lions literally, you want to talk about a guy who was beaten down by an organization, that's Joey Harrington. Mm-hmm. The Lions beat him down and took away all of his confidence. He was mm-hmm. never going to have a, a successful career after his time here. We okay, destroyed I, that man's mental psyche. I was about to say, because like it, I, th- I, thought you, I thought you were saying we didn't properly utilize him, but like, I was gonna, about to say like, he sucked in other teams too, but if you want to say we destroyed his psyche, it's probably a different thing. We destroyed that man's mm-hmm. mental psyche. If I could find the article for you. I mean, remember, I, remember I when he had a passer rating for of zero, and I think it was Atlanta or Miami. I don't know. One of the teams he went to after us, he, he had a game of, rate, a passer rating of zero. Like the in bare terms minimum of passer rating and game have. planning, though, we did not utilize him properly at all. Like he, he, mm-hmm. we taking him out of Oregon when we took him, he was a certain type of quarterback. They tried to change him when he got here, and it was never mm-hmm. going to work. And because they tried to change him so much, they destroyed him mentally. I'll mm-hmm. look for the article after we're finished recording, and I'll see if I can send it over to you. It's, mm-hmm. it's actually a pretty insightful article. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. But, the organization has been making players miserable since like 1989. Like that. Let's let's be real. Yeah, probably longer ago than that. In all reality, is there any other organization that's made two Hall of Famers retire early? <laughs> you know, the uh, one that does immediately come to mind is the Browns because Joe Thomas did retire early on them. Like he he wasn't that old, if I remember right, and he just recently retired. Uh, he's only 36 years old. And he retired like three years ago. So there's a guy that, and he is without a doubt a Hall of Famer. Dude's got like no, eight all pros. I'm not disagreeing there. Um, outside of him, though, I don't follow or care enough about the Cleveland Browns to tell you how many Hall of Famers they've had in recent years. Probably not many. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> but he is one that would come to mind. Another terrible, god awful organization. Also, one thing I didn't realize, I just because I just Googled Joey Harrington, I didn't know that the O like Oregon O gesture with your hands was popularized by Joey Harrington. Neither did I. You taught me something <laughs> else today about Joey Harrington. The man left a legacy. All right. <laughs> Apparently I'll have to see if it, okay. Play. Okay. Here's an article from the freep playing yeah. for Detroit lions drove Joey Harrington into depression. I mean, playing for the lions to drive almost anyone into depression. 
being a fan. Watching the Lions is good enough to try someone. Heavy into depression. I'll have to see if I can find the article for you. It's a good one. Did you happen to watch the ESPN broadcast? Did you watch the local broadcast yesterday? Uh, I caught uh, snippets of the ESPN one. So did you see? uh, I'm assuming you saw Eli and uh, Peyton Manning. Yeah, I. You know what? I like that. Peyton was. Oh, I love it. Peyton was given. Jared Goff, like he he was giving him massive props. Like he was saying that he thinks Jared Goff is like a championship caliber quarterback or can be a championship caliber quarterback. Can you and argue like, that he's not considering he's been to the Super Bowl? I mean, here's the thing. I like Trent Dilfer won a Super Bowl. <laughs> I've said it before, like I don't view when I think championship caliber quarterback, I think that quarterback is the reason the team went to the Super Bowl. I can't say Jared Goff is the reason the Rams Fair. went to the Super Bowl. Fair. He did make a Pro Bowl that year, though. Yeah. Like, he was a good quarterback. Yeah, well, yeah, there was one year with the Rams where he was actually a really good quarterback. I thought it wasn't he good with two, the Rams for two years. Well, there's one year in particular I'm thinking of where he threw for like damn near 3,000 yards. He had like, I want to say almost 40 touchdowns. You mean 5,000 yards? Sorry, 5,000 yards, yeah. He had two years where he threw for almost 5,000 yards, in fact. Mm-hmm. To give you an idea, Jared Goff has actually made two Pro Bowls. Okay. Probably those uh, two years. 2017, 2018. He yep. threw for 3,804 yards in 2017. 28 touchdowns, seven picks. Those are very respectable numbers. Good year. Yeah. 2018, 4,688 yards, 32 touchdowns, 12 picks. Mm-hmm. Again, great numbers. 2019 where he started to fall off. Of. Yeah. 2019, he threw 22 touchdowns, 16 picks. So that's where he started yeah. to really turn the ball over a lot. So let's look forward real quick to the Ravens game before we close out the show. Ravens are, the Pit Lions are entering the game plus seven and a half, which I think is not enough. Give me Baltimore. <laughs> yeah, I got Baltimore to cover. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, like, you need to give me like, you could honestly, 12 or 13 and a half. Go into you could honestly go into just about every game outside of a few. If you're not mm-hmm. giving me more than eight to ten points, if you're not giving me double digit points, I probably won't take the Lions. Yeah, like, outside of a couple of games, like the Falcons, mm-hmm. probably less than a touchdown. Who else is terrible that they played? The Bengals, probably less than a touchdown. Like outside of a few games here and there, you need to give me at least ten double digit points mm-hmm. for me to even consider the Lions. Do the Lions even have the personnel? to contain Lamar Jackson on the ground. No. I'm not too worried about him through the year outside of Mark Andrews, but... If they're willing to play Derek Barnes, yes, I think he's one guy who can be that sideline-to-sideline, go-get-him type of guy. But outside of him, Jamie Collins, maybe at times, but I don't think he can keep up with them. Um, Would you limit Derek Barnes to just being a spy on Lamar Jackson the whole game? Probably. Probably. I would say you see that dude right there, the tall guy that's really fast that throws the ball too. Yeah, go get him. <laughs> Just do not let him get behind get past you. That's your job. Because in all reality, he is the Ravens running game right now. Like Ty Johnson. Oh yeah. Like Ty Williams. Tyson Williams did look good. Ty Johnson. Dude. Tyson Williams did look good. He turned it up in that Lamar Jackson. He turned it up in that Sunday night game. He started off slow, but he right. Lamar Jackson is their running game after they've mm-hmm. lost their entire running back room. Like I'm pretty sure he had to introduce himself to some of the running backs in that room after week, uh, you know, the past week. Yeah. After all the injuries they had, it's kind of like, oh, who who was the quarterback that had to introduce himself mm-hmm. to the center in the huddle? Oh no, that was the. Are you, think, are you talking about the running back for the Lions that introduced himself to the team in preseason in the huddle? No, there was a quarterback who literally ha- like introduced himself to one of his linemen in the huddle at, at a game. Uh, I can't remember who it was. That. I was watching. It was one of those ESPN like expose things on Sports mm-hmm. Center or whatever, and I remember watching it, just going, just dying laughing when I heard that. Yeah. Like he they, he literally introduced himself. Hey, you know, welcome. You know, this is the play. So who are you? <laughs> but um, yeah, and. The other, the other thing I'm worried about on for Sunday's game against the Ravens is if the way we played Tanyan is any indication, like not that Tanyan had like all these targets or anything, but every time the ball went his way, it looked like whoever was defending him had zero shot at either tackling him or defending the pass. And if that's what we looked like with Tanyan, I can only imagine what it's going to look like with Mark Andrews. I mean, at, at this point, is it any surprise that every single tight end does well against the lions. Like the lions have been bad against tight ends for the last five years. Mm-hmm. 
I fully expect tight ends to be near the top in receiving in every single game against against us. Yeah. Like it, the Lions cannot figure out how to cover a guy like that, and it's because, <laughs> frankly, they haven't really had a ton of the personnel to do it. Mm-hmm. I think Derek Barnes is a guy that can. Go mm-hmm. figure. And and I know I, I talk about the guy a lot, but he honestly looks like one of the most capable in terms of potential and play style linebackers we've had here in this town in a long time. Like since DeAndre Levy, for God's sakes. What I would give to have DeAndre Levy on this team right now. Honestly? Not like DeAndre Levy like as he is today. Like honestly, if we can... <laughs> What's the point? True. No, you know, true. <laughs> what's the point? Like, if you were to tell me that you were going to bring back Matthew Stafford, Calvin Johnson, let's throw (laughs) Gosder Sherlis out on the right side of the line because he was pretty solid. Uh, We'll throw Golden Tate and Marvin Jones on this team. Then defensively speaking, let's bring back Sue Fairley. (laughs) You know, it's just it just sucks having nothing to get excited about with the Lions every week. Like. I'm watching the Lions just to watch them at this point. Like, there's nothing to excite me. I'm just looking at a TV screen. It's tough. I just to wish they were like mildly you know entertaining. Your team is playing for literally nothing. Yeah, I'm saying I just wish they had like some guys here that would make it mildly entertaining. I agree. I, I completely agree because in all reality, the guys that we're looking out for are guys whose names we don't want to hear a lot. Yeah, like you don't want to hear Sewell's name. That means he's getting beaten up. Yep. You don't want to hear, granted, can't anymore, but you don't want to hear Melifanwu and Okuda's names because that means they're getting beat. If you don't hear their names, they're playing well. So the guys that we want to, you know, see succeed. Well, we're not going to hear their names. So they're going to be no, playing well the rest of the season. But I know. But the guys that we want to see succeed <laughs> and get excited about are guys you don't really get to see much. So even if they do well, it's not exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of watching DeAndre Soot and Hawk, that's about it. That, that's that's really it. it. That is it. That is it. Like golf friend. isn't even an exciting quarterback. He just no. He's like, like is, the, is golf really a guy? He's the connecting he, tissue right now. He, he right. He's, he's getting the, us from point A to he's point the B. Stop gap. Yeah. And that's kind of how I look at him. It, it, I don't think he can be the quarterback of the future for this team. And regardless of what Peyton Manning says, like he's not. As of right now, he's not. Until he learns how to throw downfield. Granted, we got to give him some personnel to be able to throw the ball to downfield, mm-hmm. but. Till he can show me that he can do that, he's not the guy to lead this team in the future. Yeah. He's the guy in between Stafford and the next guy. You know what surprises me? Hmm. That the Lions-Ravens spread is not the biggest of the week. It's going to be the Dolphins spread. No. Really? What is? The, 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 Dolphin, the Dolphins spread is actually only plus three and a half. Who are, okay, who are they playing? Uh, the Raiders, who are 2-0. and oh, Who beat... <laughs> What? Oh, wait, are they Raiders are two and zero? Derek Carr yeah, yeah, looks like yeah, an yeah, MVP yeah, yeah, yeah. so far. Dude's thrown for like a thousand yards in two games. He's amazing. What the hell happened there? So there, there is there are two other teams or three other teams that are plus seven and a half. There's the Texans against the Panthers. Okay. There's the Jaguars against the Cardinals. Especially considering I'm pretty sure Tyrod Taylor's hurt already. <laughs> yeah, there's that, who, that who was more. it? Te- uh, Jags against the Cardinals. Trevor Lawrence has looked terrible. Continue. Mm-hmm. And Browns against the Bears. Or sorry, Bears against the Browns. Bears are giving seven or getting seven and a half against the okay, Browns. Okay, that makes sense because Andy Dalton went down and Justin Fields looked terrible in yeah. that game. So now here, here are your two teams that actually have a higher spread than the Lions. The Washington football team is plus eight and a half against the Bills. Okay. And then the New York Jets are plus ten and a half against the Broncos. I think both those. I think both the Jets and Broncos are terrible. I don't see how the Jets are getting plus ten and a half. Like I get they suck, but the, so Broncos, are the Broncos aren't terrible. They're just not a good football team. Like I, I would consider the Broncos to be very firmly mediocre. Yeah. Like they've got are, are some we, really nice pieces there. I, I feel like this is solely based on Zach Wilson's performance last week. <laughs> yeah, like the Jets are not a good football team. They are a terrible football team, yeah. and the Bills are just because they're so good and. The Washington football team, while they're a solid football team, they aren't. Well, they have to start Taylor Heineke again, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he's looked halfway decent in his two games so far. Like, he hasn't yeah. looked terrible. Yeah. So, but either way, it's going to be another w- week of same old, same old for the Lions here this season. And, and it's going to be a lot of that this year. The Lions, mm-hmm. just, they are what they are, and they are who we thought they were. 
Like they, yeah. they, we knew coming in, they're not going to be good this year. We knew after week one, they're really not going to be good this year. Yeah. We know after week two, wow, this team, like offensively and defensively, this team is very bad. We're gonna, we're gonna sound like a broken record here in a few weeks because we're, we're gonna keep saying out of things. It. Talk about if the Pistons don't start up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, shit. We may have start talking Red Wings. Hey, they just they, signed. They just signed Bobby Ryan to a player professional tryout contract today. Preseason Woo! starts in two weeks, right? For the Pistons, I think so. I lo- I love the Red Wings, but I know this is not a Red Wing show. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you you couldn't tell a hockey puck from a yeah. soccer ball. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I couldn't. <laughs> you know who's let's, been the big let's surprise put it this way. I'd be just as good of an owner of a hockey team as a Ford Jarrow football team. You know, I might even have to give the edge to the force in that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? No, I honestly believe you could surround yourself with the right people. I can learn hockey. I don't think the Fords can learn football. I'm past that point. <laughs> <laughs> you know who really has been the surprise of the city? And I know I, I talked a lot of dirt on them earlier in the year and I said a lot of stuff, but the Detroit Tigers have actually vastly impressed me for what they've got on that roster this season. Mm-hmm. So kudos to them. They're only like four games or three games below 500. Like the, they're, they're on the playoff one, right? No, God, no. Yeah. Like they're 15 games out of that. Yeah. But they're only but two considering games we behind, expect them to be one of the worst teams in the league. Right. And they're third place in their division, two games behind second place in their division. Like they are not an awful baseball team. And then, and, and then, in uh, all reality, next year I think you get Casey, uh, not Casey, my Spencer Torkelson called up, and Riley Green. Like you, you get those guys called up, right? See those guys called up. Depends on if they're going to play that service time game. I hate that stupid rule. Like I get it, but it pisses me off. I, what is that rule? So, sir, we'll the close out with rule, the MLB service time. Right, the service time rule in baseball is <laughs> basically <laughs> like. It's kind of like how they do in hockey where a guy on a minor league contract, like, you know, when you draft a guy, their contract is a certain length. It's like five years. Then you get two arbitration years before they hit Mm -hmm. free agency or something like Mm -hmm. that, whatever it is, depending on where they're drafted. The way it works in baseball is that clock does not start until they get a year, until they get a fish, they, until they finish their official rookie year. So that clock starts like year one is that rookie year, but you don't get a full year of quote unquote service time into mm-hmm. your rookie contract until you play a certain amount of games. So mm-hmm. you can come up and play 25 games in the month of, or 20 games in the month of October, 25 games in October. But if you're, that's all you played this year, you're still a rookie next year. Interesting. So the, the rookies, the basically being a rookie is a certain amount of game consideration. There is, there's a cutoff a based on how much yeah. you've played in, a, in, a, in mm-hmm. the regular season. Yes. You have to hit a game threshold, not like, yeah. oh, you played, so you're a rookie. Uh-huh. Right. Not like okay. the NBA gotcha. where your first year is your rookie year, no matter mm-hmm. what, if you play or not. Like it's, yeah. Well, granted, if in terms of... If you didn't play at all, I don't think it is. Yeah, no, because yeah. Ben Simmons won it in his yeah. second year, which was his mm-hmm. one rookie of the year in his second year because he didn't mm-hmm. play at all. But regardless... That's the way baseball. So in a lot of teams, mm-hmm. what they'll do is they will call a guy up in late September or whatever, or in September mm-hmm. to a, a, a prospect like a Spencer Torkelson to get him some major league reps yeah. and opportunities. Just sprinkle in the game so he's not technically a rookie. And yet. then they'll push yeah. him back down to start the year or he'll only come up for like five that's games annoying. here, four games here, just so he keeps below that threshold. That's- and well, just so that they can push that it's, contract back a year further into his development. Like instead of annoying. him starting his rookie year at 22, he'll start it at 23. I yeah, feel like that would, I feel like that piss off the player. It does very it much does. so <laughs> <laughs> very much so, but you know You're what? Taking this, a year out of my potential earnings. But so like, you know what though? The baseball players association is very powerful. Baseball contracts mm-hmm. are fully guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Like fully guaranteed, so the, I mean the players have gotten a lot of a lot. They in better their be favor. with the amount of games they have to play. Yeah, well, with a lot, there's a lot in the fit baseball players' favor in terms of their contracts as well. Yeah. So, either way, but that's a team that has surprised me much this year. And in all reality, they've actually been pretty fun to watch at times. And, and let's, let's right hope now, the they're beating surprise some us good too. teams. I hope so too. Like right here, right now, before preseason starts, you know, we'll end it off with this. Yeah. Right at the one hour mark. Give me a number. How many games Pistons win in this year? 35. You know, I was going to put the over under at 35 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so like, I think their absolute ceiling is 
playing tournament. And that's so if like everything swings right. 42, 43 wins. Yeah. Like that's that's a good well, playing tournament. 30, 35 would might actually even be enough to get you. Right, that 10 that's what I mean. 41, get, yeah. 42 games or 43 mm-hmm. games is like a good playing tournament. Mm-hmm. That that's teams above five hundred. Yeah. Everybody. And that doesn't happen in the Eastern Conference. Mm-hmm. Hell, you see seven seeds below five hundred in these. <clears throat> I have firmly the belief that we could have won more games than we did last year. Did we not basically open? Oh, the tank? I, absolutely! Uh, just the way that team so, played. They just that Jeremy Grant didn't play for like two the final two months. Yeah. So like, I'm not basing it off improving on the record of last year. I'm improve, I'm basing on proving what I think a record would have been last year. I mean, just looking at the personnel, what they have, and who they've got there, like this team is going to start coming into the fold, and like you're going to start seeing this team be a a contender in in for the playoffs at least like the, this this team is nearing the end of their rebuild they've got the pieces you know they've yeah. got to add a couple more here develop the pieces they have but they've they've got the pieces they want to move forward with yeah so time's almost but, here yeah so for me like right around mid 30s would be where my expectation is if they start flirting with 40 wins and they've exceeded my expectations fair enough 40 wins in my mind would be where I say they exceed my expectations. Anything mm-hmm, below yeah. that, as long as they stay above 33, mm-hmm. like between 33 and 39, that's my expectation. 33 mm-hmm. and 38 expectation. 39 yeah. plus, that's exceeded in my mind. Mm-hmm. Just kind of like what you said, just putting yep. in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> so. Just put actual numbers there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anyways, guys, that is going to close it out for this week. We thank you for listening. Andrew, thank you for joining me. Thank you to Detroit Sports Podcast as always. Follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Report. We will catch you guys next week. This has been the Fan Reporters. Bye, fans. For fans. Have a good one, guys. Enjoy your week. Enjoy the weekend. And uh, go Lions. Woo! Woo! <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>